the 26th of January, and you're listening to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Tamer Beck, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 42nd episode. Last week, we talked about the innovation in the space of payments and the role technology is playing in financial inclusion. But that discussion was about the scene in Southeast Asia, whereas some truly transformational developments are taking place in South Asia at a scale only rivaled by China. Solving the problem about the financial reach of the unbanked has been the obsession of several micro-entrepreneurs over the past half a century, with a deep desire to do good by fostering lending, capital building, investing, and networking among the poor, these entrepreneurs have helped lift tens of millions of people out of poverty. Two of the world's largest NGOs come from Bangladesh, Grameen Bank and Prak, founded by Muhammad Yunus and Fazle Abed respectively, have received worldwide recognition for their pioneering work with rural cooperatives and social enterprises. So, let's talk to someone who is at the helm of microfinance. Shamiran Abed is the director of microfinance at Prak, a company that is based in Bangladesh but has operations across South Asia, East Asia, and Africa. Shamiran chairs the board of Brack Bank's mobile financial services subsidiary, Bcash. We'll talk a lot about that today. He is also the chairman of the Microfinance Network Steering Committee and a member of the Partnership for Responsible Financial Inclusion and the World Economic Forum Financial Inclusion Steering Committee. Shamiran Abed, welcome to Kopi Time. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, I'd like to start with the very current juncture. Uh, give us a sense of how the coronavirus pandemic has affected your organization, Brax, uh, clients. Yeah, thanks very much. So, uh, you know, uh, as you know, BRAC is a large development organization. We work across m- multiple sectors from financial services to health, education, rights, gender, agriculture. I mean, we do all the different elements of uh, poverty and, and discrimination and exploitation. But um, specifically on, on financial services, we have, you know, microfinance activities now in seven countries. Bangladesh, of course, is where we started, and that's by far the largest of our operations. But globally, uh, we serve roughly seven and a half million clients um, with a balance sheet of about three point eight billion dollars. That's uh, that's full microfinance. Um, in Bangladesh, obviously, you know uh, we've got very large microfinance operations. We're the largest microfinance provider in the country, and obviously, uh, by by definite by dint of being the lar- one of the largest in Bangladesh, we are also one of the largest in the world because the largest MFIs in Bangladesh are among the largest in the world. So we have in Bangladesh uh, roughly 2,600 microfinance branches through which we serve about about 7.2 million clients. Uh, We have a balance sheet of uh, about $3.5 billion, basically divided into two segments. So we've got the, the, the more traditional microfinance segment. So when you think of microfinance, you think of the women and the groups. Um, so that's our, you know, our basic microfinance segment. Um, that's about 90% of our clients and about 50% of our portfolio, right? Uh, we have another segment, which is a slightly higher, uh, what we call a micro enterprise segment. Uh, this is sort of, a bit, I mean, we started this about 20 years ago because we saw that there is this missing group between microfinance and the bank, S- where bank SME starts. And so we got into this slightly higher individual loan segment. So here the clients are basically very small traders, you know, very small uh, sort of entrepreneurs who don't quite qualify for a bank SME loans uh, alone because they don't have, um, they can't provide all the paperwork. They don't necessarily have a trade license, uh, but they're too big for a group microfinance loan, right? So those are our two segments. In that segment, it's about 10% of our clients but about 50% of our portfolio, just because the loan sizes um, are quite a lot, lot bigger. Uh, so when the pandemic started, obviously we, we kind of looked at how the, that was impacting both our traditional microfinance clients and also our micro enterprise clients. Um, and obviously, you know, in the early days when we went into lockdown at the end of March in, I mean, I'm talking about Bangladesh now primarily, um, you know, it impacted you know, both the client segments very, very hard, right? So if I look at my traditional microfinance clients, obviously when the lockdown happened, you know, first it impacted, I would say the, uh, the more urban, peri-urban clients. Uh, but as the lockdown remained uh, for about a month and a half, two months in Bangladesh, uh, it then, the, the, the effects effect moved to rural um, and of course, and affected our rural clients as well. On this, in the larger micro enterprise side, 
uh, it, it was immediate because all shops were closed, um, you know, transportation was closed, service sector was closed. I mean, immediately, almost all our clients were impacted, right? The only clients that I would say that were less impacted were the ones that were almost entirely in agriculture-based activities. Uh, they kind of, you know, because of the, the, because of the way they do their business or the, their income gen the way their income generation happens, were slightly spared from it. But anything in, in production, manufacturing, services were, were very, very badly affected. Um, so what we did, obviously, is at the beginning, obviously, because BRAC does a lot of work in health and, uh, you know, a lot of the BRAC's focus, even from the microfinance side, was on, um, uh, was on awareness building uh, in the early days around hand washing and social distancing and all of that. From the financial services side, at the beginning, when the lockdown happened and the regulator said, you know, uh, you know, you've got to stop activities entirely. Uh, what we basically did was uh, started refunding uh, deposits, savings, right? So uh, as a microfinance institution in, in several of the countries where we operate, including Bangladesh, we're also, we're also deposit taking. So we hold a lot of client deposits. And what we were finding out at the time was that obviously people were depleting whatever little cash they had because they weren't earning anything. Uh, and starting to borrow again. And a lot of the borrowing was happening from, from informal money lenders. So we just got ahead of that and we said, look, I mean, you know, don't have to pay us our loans. This is what you save for. You save for a rainy day, this is a rainy day. So if you want your savings, just come and ask for it and you can have as much as fit as you, as you want. Uh, but of course, you know, during lockdowns and when branches are closed, even that's difficult, right? So then we quickly partnered up with sort of mo mobile money providers. Uh, wherever, you know, wherever that's possible. And in Bangladesh, obviously, as you know, we have a Bragg Bank subsidiary called Bcash, which is the largest mobile money company in the country. And we already have partnership, partnership with them on, on a few things, although we hadn't done savings refunds through Bcash before. But we quickly got onto that and said and told our clients, open a Bcash account, you know, and send us the number and then tell us how much money you need and we will just Bcash it to you. Um, and that kind of really took on. Uh, took off, sorry, and 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 you know we got a lot of demand for savings refunds. So basically, in the months of April and May, uh, that was primarily what we were doing, just trying to get cash back out into into the hands of our clients because that's what they needed most. And then from sure, June onwards, to, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask you one thing. Just staying with the area of that April and May when you were seeing a lot of distress. So now, mm -hmm. sitting in January of 2021, looking back at the last six seven months. The, the macro data seem to suggest that Bangladesh has not done as poorly as a few other neighboring economies, uh, yeah. but do you have any sort of, you know, rich detail that you could share with us in terms of uh, jobs lost or income lost or, you know, sort of livelihoods affected? I mean, what's your sort of vantage point telling you about the impact of it overall? You know, uh, you know ever since this pandemic started, in, in Bangladesh and we went into lockdown, there's been quite a few studies that have, ha that have been done, uh, some by the BRAC Institute of Governance, uh, some by PPRC and CPD and others. Um, they all paint a pretty, you know, uh, pretty dim picture, I have to say. So, you know, this whole concept of the new poor came out uh, mm -hmm. about seven or eight months ago through some of these research, research studies. So what they were looking at is how many people who are not in poverty have fallen into poverty or fallen be below the poverty line as a result of the pandemic and the economic fallout of that. Uh, those studies are, are, are quite bad. So, I mean, you know, our, our, our extreme poverty numbers had come down to about 20, 20 21%. Um, uh, and then the lower number was around 12, 13%, right? Um, now they were saying that this will double. Some of the studies have said this will double as a result of the pandemic, right? Um, at the beginning, when we were doing these, these very quick and dirty surveys on how people are doing, a lot, of our, a lot of the people surveyed were saying, you know, we only have a little more runway and then we'll run out of food or we'll run out of cash. Um, and then we, we're basically going to starve, right? So at the time, it seemed like things were going to think it was going to be really bad. Uh, at this point, we're, all, we're trying to go back out and to, to see how bad it was. Obviously, there was a period of time that people lost income, um, but a lot of people have then gotten back into income generation activities as the lockdown has, has been lifted and then slowly economic activity has started. But then a lot of economic activity has not started. Um, 
you know, there are, you know, still now when we talk to our clients, especially that micro enterprise segment of clients, they often tell us that my revenues are still not back up to pre pandemic levels. So I'm still my shops open, people are coming in but my revenues are about 70, 80%. It, you know, that's a good thing. If we see that, we think this, this person is almost back to where they are. There are certain businesses they are saying we're not even at 50% of where we were at pre-pandemic levels. Um, a lot of, you know, small, you know, in our smaller portfolio, a lot of people have not been able to, go, uh, you know, get their jobs back, right? So one way that I'm trying to look at this, because the macro data is kind of very dim and kind of <laughs> all over the place at this point, um, is to look at look, looking at our clients, you know, and what's happening there. So there are a few dynamics that have happened that we've got to watch very carefully. This idea that some people have fallen into poverty who are not in poverty, and where are they, what are they doing, and what do they plan to do? But on top of that, there is this whole issue of internal migration that's happened. A lot of people who are in the cities who've mm. now moved back into the rural areas because they couldn't find jobs, and it's very expensive to live in the cities if you don't have in, income coming in. Uh, so now they've moved back into rural areas, but they haven't been in rural areas for 10, 15 years because they were in the city. So they, they've lost a lot of those, you know, that social connections and social capital. So there, um, you know, they've got experience of working in the city or even running a small enterprise in the city. But now that they've gone back, they don't have the social capital um, or the connections to be able to get financing and start something up and all of that. So a lot of people have gone back into the rural areas and just sitting there wondering what to do. Uh, so we're also looking at, you know, how do we now lend to them there? Um, how do we set them up with some income generation there? Um, or are they going to come back? Um, is it, you know, does it make sense to say, okay, you're, this is only temporary. You're obviously going to go back to the cities when jobs are av available again. And as a, as a microfinancier, I mean, we've got to, <laughs> that's a really... Uh, important distinction, like, should we start lending to them in these areas? But then if tomorrow they get their job back and they've left that and they've gone back, then my, then my loan goes into default, right? So we're trying to do a lot of surveys on, you know, who's here? Why are they here? Are they planning to stay where, they've now, where they are now? Or will they move back to the cities uh, when jobs uh, come back? Uh, should, we start, should we start setting them up here? Have they brought back their families as well? Or what's happening? So that's this new poor segment is one we're studying very hard right now and trying to understand. Overall, just quickly, if you ask me, I would say probably about 20, 25% of our clients have been fairly badly impacted by COVID. I would say about 75% to 80% of our clients in the micro segment and in the, in the enterprise segment are back to a point where, you know, I mean, even if they're not fully back to pre-pandemic levels, they're almost there or getting there. Uh, it's that, it's that 20% we're worried about. Very interesting. And I really want to get deeper into that issue of, uh, you know, small borrowers, the, the virtue of being associated with a micro lender, how much resiliency that has afforded them. But before I get there, uh, earlier you were talking about some of the solutions you have provided to your clients. Uh, so you suggest, uh, you told us that, you know, you were sort of refunding deposits and, and coming up with innovating way of reaching people in remote areas through their um, Bcash platform. Uh, are you also sort of giving people loan moratoria or, or do you, are, are you still making people sort of, you know, service their loans? So what happened is when the pandemic hit, obviously, we got some uh, regulatory forbearance, right? So from the regulator, regulator basically said you can't classify loans. You can collect, but you cannot, you know, you cannot classify loans. You can't, you know, basically. Uh, and it was mainly done for the banks, but they kind of extended that to the microfinance sector as I well. See. Um, so we were, we were uh, allowed to open up again from about mid-May. Um, so May, June, uh, we weren't collecting. We were just telling our clients, if you want to pay back and if you want to come to our branch and pay back, uh, you can, but our, our staff will not go out to the field for collections. From July, we started collecting. Um, the, the, the group started up again and we started going to the groups to, get, uh, to start collections. But all through the last six months, we've basically said to our staff, collect from those who can pay um, and, um, and you, know, don't, you know, don't keep going and asking for money from people who are clearly impacted and cannot pay. Uh, so so on, the, on the collection side, we've tried to be as flexible as possible. But on top of that, we've done two other things. Uh, one is uh, we've, we've uh, 
formally refinanced a lot of loans, right? Mm-hmm. So, so a lot of our clients, we've gone in, we've seen in July, August, September that they're paying some installments, um, that they're trying to get their you know, income generation back on, but they need a little bit more cash right now because they've depleted, depleted a lot of cash. So if they get a fresh injection of cash now, uh, they could actually get back on their feet a lot quicker. So we said, fine. Um, it doesn't matter if you're if you're you know if you're current on your payments. Uh, we will just give you additional capital now, uh, and hopefully that will help you start up businesses, and then that will help you not only pay off our loans but get back on your feet uh, and, and hopefully quickly get back into to pre-pandemic level. So we did a lot of refinancing. We've refinanced uh, at this point about close to four hundred million dollars worth. Um, since July. So it's, I'm not talking about we've just refinanced a few people. We've refinanced uh, about 15% of our total borrower base uh, of 7.2 million. So that's almost a, it's a million people, right? Um, so that's been a big focus of what we've been doing. Um, the, and, and sorry, I should have also said, we've also been disbursing aggressively, right? So one of the lessons that I learned from, you know, from managing Ebola post-Ebola microfinance recovery in West Africa, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, where we have microfinance entities, was that, you know, once the, once the crisis ends or the crisis starts, um, you know, dissipating, you can't as a microfinancier say that I'm going to start collecting again. And then once my collection stabilizes, I'm going to start disbursing again, right? Uh, we thought we would do that, but that was the wrong strategy. What we found was that actually at the end of a crisis, people need money. And if you can actually go out and start disbursing aggressively, people also pay back aggressively because they know that this, finan- this uh, financial institution is actually going to be with me, is going to give me the money I need, so I better pay off their loans as well, and, or at least try to, right? So this time we thought, okay, we're gonna use that, that experience. As soon as, the lo- you know, as soon as the lockdown ends and we're able to start operating our branches again, we're just gonna go out and start disbursing aggressively. So we started doing that as well. So once we started disbursing, you know, our, our, you know, our collections picked up. But then on top of that, as I mentioned, we did the refinancing. And then the third thing I said, the, the other thing I wanted to mention, we, we've also done a lot of formal refinance, uh, sorry, rescheduling. So we've said to our clients, you know, you haven't paid us in the months of from mid-March to June. So we, we're already three months behind, but that's okay. And now you start paying small installments, if, even if you can't make the full installment, come and tell us how much you can actually pay. Um, uh, and you know, if you've got six installments left, but you can only pay half the installment at this point, we'll give you, we'll just re- reschedule it and give you a twelve-month runway, right? Uh, and you just pay your, you know, half your installment, but it won't show that you've gone into arrears because we've just rescheduled the loan. Uh, and the reason why we thought that was important is because typically in the microfinance mindset, once a loan goes bad, our our frontline staff, our branch managers and credit officers don't want to want to lend to that person again. And in this scenario, we thought it's very important to go and lend to this person again, because why should we penalize this person for being impacted by COVID, which is totally beyond their control, right? So all of that was just to make sure that we keep our loans uh, regular. Gosh, so many follow-up questions around that. It's just fascinating. Okay, for the first, for the very last thing that you said, I want to ask you about that. We're talking about millions of borrowers. That means tens of thousands of credit officers uh, who are yeah. BRAC staff. So how are you in the matter of those, those you know, foggy, very uncertain times in the middle of last year when you don't know how long this crisis would be, when analysts are telling you really dire things about how risky credit is going to be, what kind of you know, centralized guidance are you giving from BRAC headquarters to all your tens of thousands of employees? And how do you instill a culture of empathy at times like that? Is it already built in or did you have to sort of scale everybody up or bring them to this reality that you're not just a credit officer, you have to also understand the, the, the human needs at this juncture? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously having to do all of that in the time of Zoom, right, without have, being able to meet them or, 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 or you know, talk to them face to face. No, that's, that's, that's a great question. So one thing I would say is, yeah, some of it is built in, obviously, as a BRAC staff, uh, we, we do a lot of work around our, our organization's culture, how we're being em- empathetic, how you know, even in the microfinance space, where a lot of your targets are around getting the money back. How do you behave with your clients? You know, we have a code of conduct, we have our values, we do a lot of work around 
the fact that you know you cannot you cannot i mean you know obviously when someone's not paying we follow up we go and and ask for the money but we don't you know uh, we we make sure that there's a line we never cross uh, in terms of the way we deal with our clients but now in this pandemic situation obviously we've had to really inf- reinforce that right uh, that's why in the months of may and june even though the regulator said you can now go back out and start doing activities we said no we're not going to send our people out to the field uh, to do collections because at that time you know the lockdown had ended but you know the the effect of lockdown had hadn't ended there was still you know people were scared cases were going up nobody was doing anything so in that time going out and asking for money uh, would would send the wrong message and then you know so a lot of the other mfis actually did start going out uh, in june for example uh, but we weren't right and i just wanted to drive this sense that getting the money back is not the most important thing you know stay with your clients talk to your clients understand what's happening we'll go back and ask for money but also let's see who needs money so we can go out and start disbursing now on the on the organization side the one thing i would say uh, that i've learned over the last few months is how quickly people adapt to new things right mm. uh, even our field staff the way they've kind of taken on to you know like zoom calls i mean even our credit officers i mean if you if you if you you know if you told me you know in february or you know end of january 2020 that in 3 months you're going to talk to all your frontline credit officers through digital technology i would say no way uh, that's going to take another few years right uh, but it happened uh, we started doing regular calls and as a matter of fact a lot of our head office staff uh, colleagues have said that actually we felt even more connected to the field uh, because because we got used to talking to them through these digital platforms and then we were talking a lot more than we usually do because because normally we'd have to go to the field do a meeting pe- call people in but now you know we say look we need to talk about this can you guys get on a zoom call so they did a lot of that maybe we had overdone it even uh, so that was you know so that's how we did it but yeah this through this whole time we put a lot of emphasis on how we should be behaving what is important for us to do as brag but generally also as a country which is trying to get over this pandemic and us as a large development actor in that in that you know in that space you know how should we be impact how should we be trying to have impact right uh, and that is something we just communicated continuously throughout the last you know several months um, very deliberately shamran the insight that you shared earlier that during times of crisis you don't want to be so obsessed with credit quality that you stop dispersing that actually exacerbates the crisis I found it fascinating because although it sort of makes common sense, even a dozen years ago, it was not part of the zeitgeist in economics. I mean, even after the global financial crisis, the idea was how to get back to normal and you know austerity and belt tightening and you know, debt reduction, which as a result, we saw 10 years of very anemic global recovery. And right. having learned that, at least at the macro level, governments around the world are making sure that the fiscal position remains loose. So I love the fact that at the micro level, you also have absorbed exactly the same insight and, and, and which is you know, as applicable at the micro level as it is in the macro level. Uh, you were talking about you know, sort of getting this um, uh, transition accelerated from you know, face-to-face meetings to Zoom meetings, and again, uh, reaching out to tens of thousands of your officers. But you have operations in very remote parts of the country. I mean, what about connectivity and bandwidth and digital infrastructure, have they all held up? Well, I mean, obviously our, our staff in the more remote rural areas uh, have had greater challenges. Um, the, the, the good thing I would say is that the, because of the telco network, uh, you know, because the, 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 the mobile f- service providers have created sort of you know, infrastructure all over the country, uh, in Bangladesh, I would say now, because it's, it's a very small country geographically with a very high population density, um, it's, I think, been easier to cover pretty much the entire country with, you know, uh, with obviously first mobile phone, you know, but then also data. Um, so at this point, other than, you know, some parts of the Chittagong Hill Tracks, for example, which is in the southeast, it's, it's uh, you know, it's particularly remote in the context of Bangladesh. Other than that, almost everywhere, we've been able to make it work, right? Um, obviously, you know, it's not always stable. Uh, some places it's harder to get that, but more or less, 
that hasn't come come up as a big challenge. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's it's held up. I would say. That's that's just amazing. And I guess five years ago that would have been unthinkable. Maybe even three years ago it would have been unthinkable. Three years ago, exactly. Yeah. So so I, I always say that you know we've had this amazing stress test of the global bandwidth capability with this you know five x ten x rise in uh, video conferencing, and it sort of held up. I haven't heard any spectacular failures anywhere. And the fact yeah. that you can reach your rural officers, you know, fairly seamlessly, I mean, that's brilliant. Ashamran, uh, everything that we have talked about sort of leads me to this bigger question that, you know, clearly your clients have found a helpful, empathetic partner in BRAC. Um, and it's not just BRAC, it's microfinance in general, which seems to be rising to the challenge of this pandemic. So do you think that by virtue of being your client that these uh, small borrowers managed to have sort of stronger buffer uh, to deal with this shock. And I, by buffer, I just don't mean financial buffer, but also, you know, social connection, source of, you know, information. I mean, so did it, has it really paid off for them uh, by, by being part of a micro enterprise network like yours? Yeah, I would absolutely say so. Um, and as you said, it's not just the fact that they had access to their deposits uh, when, they, when they needed it during the early days of the pandemic. Uh, you know, the ability to borrow again when the pandemic, you know, when the lockdowns ended, the pandemic obviously hasn't ended. Uh, uh, you know, the refinancing we've done, the rescheduling we've done, all of that's helped. But obviously, you know, um, especially in a country like Bangladesh, I would say, uh, where, you know, most people are part of some sort of, that's some sort of a microfinance structure, right? So typically given we have these huge microfinance uh, you know, organizations, Grameen Bank, Bragg, Asha, and, and so many others. Uh, that's created, obviously, a lot of social networks and access to information. Um, you know, I, I remember, you know, a lot of these, a lot of our types of organizations in the early days were really going out and teaching people uh, that you need to distance, you need to wash hands. Uh, you know, even now when, when vaccine rollout happens, um, I would, you know, venture a guess that, I mean, you know, the government would like to use organizations like ours uh, to go out to do multiple aspects of that, not just, you know, inoculate, I mean, vaccinating people, but also to create, you know, to dispel myths and, and, and make sure people have the right information and make sure even if there is a protocol on who should get vaccinated first, you know, you need community organizations to go out and and explain that and tell people how to get vaccinated and where to go and things like that. So I think just being members of these large organi development organizations uh, gives you a lot uh, beyond just the financial services that you're able to get. And I think that is that does put you at an advantage. I mean, we're in, as I said, now, if I just quickly move out of Bangladesh in, in other countries where a microfinance sector may not be that developed or as mature as Bangladesh, although in most countries now there's been microfinance for at least about 20 years. Um, it's similar. So I think, you know, I mean, if I look at our experience in Uganda, where we have a microfinance bank in Tanzania, where we also have a fairly large microfinance entity in Myanmar and the two West African countries that I spoke about earlier, Liberia and Sierra Leone. I mean, we've been going out and trying to serve our clients, not just through the provision of financial services, but through, through this whole time, through health awareness, uh, dispelling myths, making sure our clients have access to information on what's happening. Uh, just keeping people sort of feeling, and even, you know, on the mental health side, we've done a lot of work, um, you know, so all of that, I think our clients are able to access because they're, you know, they're uh, related to us and they're part of our, as we call the Brack family. Um, and I think that does help, especially at a time like this. So I can understand you playing a critical role in dispelling misinformation and myths by being an authoritative voice. And since they have a trust thing relationship with you, they would take your word. Uh, but what about this issue that you just touched on? And it was a very important issue of the issue of mental health. I mean, are you finding ways to counsel your clients? I mean, what are you doing? Yeah, no, of course, you know, given the numbers, it's, it's really hard. And, and, and we don't have, you know, the, 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 nearly the number of sort of uh, mental health experts and, and professionals that we need. But from Bragg's side, I mean, both with our staff, uh, first of all, uh, we've tried to give them access to, you know, like if you need to talk to people and also sending out information just to make sure that they're managing their stress levels, right? Uh, 
because again, as you said earlier, you know, how are you keeping staff motivated and, and doing the right things when they themselves are going through high levels of anxiety uh, removed from their families? So we tried to do that, that during this time, you know, have avenues for our staff to access that. And then on the, uh, with, the, with the clients, we've, we've said to our staff that one of our responsibilities now uh, is to keep talking to our clients, is to listen to their problems. Don't just make it about your financial transaction. But, but really, this is the time to stand with our clients and, be, and make sure you give them comfort that we're with them. So whatever they need and, and brag being, you know, as I said, larger than just a, 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 you know, a traditional microfinance institution where we have many other services. Uh, you know, we've been saying to our clients that, you know, um, you know we are with you um, and we're gonna try to take care of your needs, whether they're health needs or other needs. Um, there are other types of challenges. I know you and I have spoken about this. You know, the fact that children have not gone to school for a whole year in Bangladesh, right? That's also creating a lot of tension, a lot of, you know, I mean, there are a lot of young people sitting around at home. Uh, you know, parents are worried about it. We also have a big worry uh, that with this kind of a long break, uh, what would that do to sort of, what would that mean for adolescent girls, right? Will they even be able, will they even ever go back to school? Uh, or will parents sort of marry them off because they've just been sitting around for too long? It doesn't make sense to send them back. So you know, we're very worried about this this group of young girls between the ages of let's say thirteen and sixteen uh, who are kind of in secondary education and have had this long break. So from Bragg's perspective, we're trying to look at it from all these different angles. You know, how do we keep people feeling okay? How do we keep supporting them? But all these things that we worry about, how do we go back out and just make sure that we're working on this? As soon as the schools open up, we can, you know, go and talk to the parents, go and talk, you know, and say, you know, send your kids back to school, you know, you know, don't marry them off. We've done a lot of work on the gender side, uh, on domestic violence, because we've seen that go up uh, on, you know, again, on adolescent girls on. So, yeah, I mean, uh, on specifically on mental health, obviously, we can only do so much, but just looking at the different elements of stresses and challenges and trying to use our entire organization to try to do as much as we can, given this difficult situation. That's what we've been focused on. It's great. Uh, I was going to ask you about the work that both you personally and through your organization have done on bridging the uh, gender and digital divide. Uh, you've already touched on some of those critical points, but even in terms of uh, female employment, uh, have they been affected as a cohort more by the pandemic or you don't see evidence of that? Um, yes, yes, I would say that uh, because of a couple of things. I mean, um, one, as you know, our, our ready-made garment sector is still uh, you know, largely um, staffed by, by women, right? So when that, when in the early days when all the garments factories shut down, obviously a lot of women lost their jobs. Um, you know, it was almost entirely women till about 10, 15 years ago. Now it's, I think, the, you know, roughly about 70% of the workforce in our garments factories are still women. Uh, a lot of our domestic staff, people who work in our homes as cooks, as cleaners, uh, are mostly women. Uh, and, and a lot of them lost their jobs because people wouldn't allow you know, outsiders to come into their homes to cook and clean and things like that. Uh, so in those two segments in the early days, especially in the urban peri-urban areas, we saw a lot of lo job loss among women. Um, in the rural areas, I would say, you know, and then obviously more formal jobs, uh, probably not that different between men and women. I mean, it would be roughly proportional to where they are. Um, but yeah, obviously um, that, that's been a challenge, but I think for, for women generally through this pandemic, uh, you know, for working women, I mean, we've seen that this has been so, so difficult this whole time. Uh, a lot of them obviously have lost jobs. Um, and we've tried to make sure that, you know, as BRAC, because that's a big focus for us. And that's a lot, big chunk of our client uh, segment that we go out and, and basically try to, try to cater to their needs. Uh, but just generally, we've seen that, you know, because of the increase in domestic violence, increase in stresses, increase in sort of stressing about children because children are home and children aren't going to school. This pandemic has by impacted women <laughs> much worse than men. And again, this is not just economically, but economically and socially, 
uh, through all of our work, what we've realized is the impact on women has been far, far worse than men, for men. Right, and I'm afraid that's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, but uh, in the case of Bangladesh, uh, especially with the schools being shut for a whole year, uh, you can yeah. immediately see the challenge a woman who works faces that you know, is she going to take care of her kids at home or is she going to step out to work? Um, so mm -hmm. the, the more prolonged nature of the lockdowns, especially with respect to education, I, I think that you know, hurts women more than men. Um, uh, Shamran, you at the beginning when we were talking about some of the solutions you're providing to your clients, you talked about using the platform of Bcash to uh, send money uh, to those who were not being able to come to branches. Uh, to those of my listeners who don't know what Bcash and you know how impactful it has been, give us a sense of you know uh, what it does and how it came to be and where it stands today. Yeah, sure. So uh, Bcash is a mobile money provider. Um, sort of, you know, I think the one that most people who have, uh, who know about this space have heard of is M-Pesa in Kenya. Yeah, uh, sure. So it's, um, it's, it's very similar to that. Uh, Bcash sort of, uh, we created the company in 2009. Uh, we got licensed and we started operations in 2011. Uh, but because obviously the size of Bangladesh and the, basically the need to send money around, uh, you know, affordably and conveniently and safely, it kind of really took on took off uh, uh, as a service. Um, you know, at this point, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very large. So Bcash currently has about, uh, well, it's more than 50 million um, accounts. Um, uh, does about roughly, I would say now, um, about eight to nine million transactions a day. Um, uh, so that's that's financial transactions, right? So actually, somebody either cashing in, sending money, cashing out, or paying a bill. Uh, these these are not sort of you know uh, it's checking your balance. So about eight to nine million financial transactions a day um, has roughly in the range of about two hundred and fifty thousand agents all across the country. Um, so by almost any measure, it's again among the largest mobile money providers in the world. Sorry, just one question. So by agents, yeah. you mean somebody who is in a little shop uh, who has a sort of a Bcash interface and people can give him cash and then upload Bcash credit on their phones? That's, that's exactly right. So it's your corner convenience store, your mom and pop store. Uh, they're just, uh, you know, they have typical natural footfall and they've just signed up to become a Bcash agent. And so they can cash you in, they can cash you out. Uh, so they just basically do that conversion between physical cash and digital cash. And it is so ubiquitous in Bangladesh that the word itself is a verb now. Correct. Yeah. And I think I already used it, used it before. You yes, know, you did. Yes, you they, did. They cash the money. That's right. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, services offered, so you alluded to, it's not just sort of domestic money. So there's no cross-border element. This is just internal money transfer. It's primarily internal, although there are there are some uh, relationships now that allow us to sort of allow people, Bangladeshis outside of Bangladesh to remit money back to the country using the Bcash platform. Uh, okay, so there so, is a cross-border so, element too. Yeah, I mean, you can't open a Bcash account outside, but you can send the money in a way that it will hit a Bcash account in Bangladesh. So it has to be done through the banking channel, but ultimately it gets paid out through Bcash. Okay. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of uh, services offered beyond transfer, you can actually carry out. So it's, it's like a e-wallet. So if you want to, you know, procure goods, you can use your Bcash account to pay for those things. Correct. Yes. Um, so, yeah, merchant payments, bill pays. Uh, yeah, all of that. Mobile top ups. Uh, yeah, all of that is possible. And can you give us a sense of its ubiquity and its depth? Like, you know, how widely you, so when you said, you know, eight to 9 million transactions per day, uh, does that sort of comprise of a very large chunk of financial transactions happening in Bangladesh? Oh, yeah. I mean, Bcash is, um, you know, as I said, Bangladesh is a country of about roughly, let's say, 170 million people, right? Uh, Bcash has 50 million accounts, over 50 million accounts. Now, obviously, then the question is how many of those accounts are, are active on a monthly basis? Um, so I think probably about um, 40 to 50 percent of that are active on a monthly basis, so about, wow. which is quite high. Um, yeah. 
typically the, the active numbers are lower than that, but Bcash account active numbers are actually quite high. Um, yeah, and it's, it's as you said, how ubiquitous is it? I mean, it's now, you know, I mean, anybody you ask, I mean, you know, like you know, anybody you ask now has a mobile phone. Um, increasingly, most people have a smartphone. Anybody you ask now would have a mobile money account in Bangladesh. I mean, you'd hardly find anyone who doesn't have it. Uh, and about 75% are, of those are Bcash accounts, right? Um, and and it's become it's big as you said the word that the name Bcash has become a verb. When we say transfer money, we call it Bcash to Bcash money. Uh, so would you say, from a financial inclusion as well as gender perspective, having a convenient tool like this has been transformational? I think it's been transformational for some types of financial transactions, right? Um, but I think there's a, there's still some ways to go. And the reason why I say that is. You know, if you're if if you think about it from the point of view of of domestic remittance tra- remittances or domestic transfers, it's been absolutely transformational, right? Because Bangladesh is a very low banked country; people don't have bank accounts here. Uh, so in the past, all these millions of people who 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 are from the rural areas but then move to the urban or peri-urban areas for jobs, you know, these almost now between three and four million women, we say, who work in Bangladesh's ready-made garments factories. Now, how do they send money home at the end of the month? So once they get their salaries, uh, how do they send money home? They don't have bank accounts. So either they would have to go and, and, and ask, a, a, you, know, you know, because you don't keep going back to your villages every month. You Maybe you go once or twice a year. So you'd have to find a relative or, or a friend who's going, and then you'd have to trust them with your money that they would actually go and give it to your, your family member that you want to send the money to. Or we had this, this network, which was basically being run by the bus companies. And this is very similar to Kenya, actually, when M-Pesa started. We had this bus network. So you'd have to go to the counter of a bus company and say that, can you send this money to my brother who'll pick it up at your counter in my, closest to my village, right? And the rates were high, you know, and all of that. Now, all of that has now become easy. You just cash in, you do the transfer within a minute, your brother, your son, your sister, your mother has the money in the village, right? So domestic remittance uh, or domestic transfers have become very easy now. And anybody who moves money around the country, they've all got either a Bcash account or a Rocket account or another mobile money account. And they do that very easily. That's been transformational. Uh, There are certain other elements. Now, the other thing that's starting to take off, I would say, is um, uh, uh, wage payments, right? So a lot of the large garments factories now are starting to digitize their, their wage payments through mobile money. because They couldn't do it with banks because our, their workers don't have bank accounts. But because their workers mostly now have mobile money accounts, they're saying, we're going to just pay salaries through that. And once you get your salary in to your account, you not only do the transfer back to your village, but you start also doing a lot of your merchant payments and other things. So that's starting to grow the whole sort of mobile money ecosystem, right? The reason why I say it's, it, it's still got some ways to go is because um, still you can't really borrow money through your, mm. by having a Bcash account. So if you just have a Bcash account, it doesn't give you access to credit. Um, and coming from where I come from, the microfinance space, I think having access to credit is so important for people, right? So if you just had a Bcash account now and not an MFI account or a bank account, uh, you could do the transfers, but you couldn't get credit. Uh, once that becomes available um, through the through your Bcash account, and it becomes, and obviously that will drive down costs. Um, then it there are regulatory be, hurdles around that. Exactly, exactly, right. Um, but I think you know these will, I think, be lifted or be eased over time to the point where we can use Bcash much more effect- effectively. Uh, and the partnership between a mobile money player and a financial institution will become a lot easier and a lot more seamless. Uh, right. And we then, see that play out yeah, in, in China, for example, in an correct. extensive yeah. way all through the economy. Um, right. We've spent quite a bit of time talking about financial services, Shamaran. I want to switch a little bit because I know that BRAC has uh, you know, devoted a significant amount of resources toward health and education. So give us a sense of your operations in these two areas. Yeah, sure. So, so those are our two large sort of, um, you know, intervention areas outside of financial services. Um, in education, um, 
you know, Brack, very interestingly, in the early days, in the 70s and 80s, and Bangladesh started with sort of adult education, but right. then realized, um, you know, very quickly that actually, you know, um, you can keep, you know, because nobody in Bangladesh was educated, education level, literacy levels were so low. Uh, that Brack realized that actually there's no point in educating adults when children are still growing up and we'll always be educating adults, but we'd have to then start educating children. So we then in the 80s moved to child education, which obviously makes all the sense. Um, the idea behind Brack's education program at the time was that l most children get enrolled into primary schools, but don't complete primary education. Uh, and they drop out for a number of reasons, economic and social. Um, so obviously economic, you know, they, they have to go out and work, they have to support their families, social, because the way it's, you know, education is structured doesn't quite work, you know, because they have to go out and help their parents in the fields and things like that. So we created this, this education model, which was trying to take into, you know, um, into account these very specific challenges that children have and why children drop out. So we started creating these one room schools with about 30 children. And these were cohort schools. So, you know, we'd take, we'd go into a village, we'd set up this one room school, we'd take in one cohort of 30 kids, start them in year one, and then take that kid through the whole, whole of primary education. But then because we were primarily taking in children who had already gone to school for a year or two and then dropped out, we condensed the five-year primary curriculum into three years, right? So we were taking slightly, slightly older children because they dropped out and then condensing primary education into three years and pushing them out and then hopefully getting them into secondary education, right? And that model that Brack created in the mid eighties, uh, we, we really were, were able to scale that. Uh, and there was obviously, you know, we were able to also raise a lot of funding to start. So at, at the height of it, we were running 60,000 of these schools all around the country. And from 1985, when we started our first group of 22 one-room schools, to now, uh, 13 million Bangladeshi children have gone through this BRAC primary education system. Um, so that's that's obviously big. So we, you know, this is a very large program that we've run. Over time, obviously, over the last 35 years, you know, this primary education model has evolved. Uh, we've gone into secondary, but we instead of setting up schools, we've done large amounts of teacher training and 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 school management training in the in the secondary sector. We've we've now for the, for the last decade or so, we're investing a lot on early childhood education because that's become a big area of focus for us. Um, we've created this new model called Play Labs um, in in partnership with organizations like Lego and and, and Sesame Workshop. Uh, which runs Sesame Street, as you know, um, trying to see how we can teach very young children through play, because that's how young children learn. So we've got this play lab model that Brad's been promoting quite a bit now. Uh, in the last three years, we then evolved that a little more, and we, we then created a model called a humanitarian play lab, uh, because we, got, we went into the, into the Rohingya camps in, in Cox's Bazar, and we found that there were all these children coming from the Myanmar side into Cox's Bazar, and not only were they dealing with typical issues, but they were dealing with humongous amounts of trauma. Um, so we then looked at how we can you know, adapt our play lab model uh, to, to deal with young children who are not only, you know, we do, we'd wanna do the normal development of young children, but also help them go to get through the trauma of that whole moving from where they were seeing death and destruction, having to walk across the border and coming into a new place and living in a camp. So again, Brex education program now is, is many things from pre-primary play labs to all the way to BRAC University, which is a tertiary education university. Uh, but really the focus has been on, on primary. And as I said, 13 million children. We've also run large amount of schools. And oh, the other thing I should say is uh, most of our schools have been primarily focused uh, for girls uh, because usually obviously in countries like ours, girls drop out a lot more and girls don't complete education. And as a result of a lot of our work, I wouldn't say only our work, but as a, as a result of that, we were one of the first countries to reach the MDG target when the, the previous to the SDGs of primary school parity, I mean, gender parity and primary completion rates. Bangladesh actually achieved that. We're one of the, was one of the first countries to achieve that among LDC countries. 
Um, we've run a lot of schools for girls in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in the Philippines, in Uganda, in Liberia. So that education model has gone outside of Bangladesh as well. Uh, and we do a lot of work on education outside of Bangladesh. Uh, again, with a particular emphasis on helping children complete primary, uh, especially uh, girl, child, girl children. Um, on the health side, Again, our work's been very community-based, so we don't run large clinics or large hospitals. That's not the kind of health work we do. It's community-based health. So, um, so we've, again, gone out and trained village women to be health workers and health volunteers. So, you know, giving them basic skills. Uh, and, and, and so basically what they're able to do is raise awareness, you know, screen for some basic, um, you know, health uh, issues, uh, and then they work as a referral service, right? So, you know, if there is something that's beyond their capability, then they will help link you with a formal uh, health provider. And what does that, that, that does, obviously, it completely changes your health seeking behavior, right? So whereas in the past, you just live with a cough for a long time till it's too late. Now, once you start coughing, a BRAC health worker will go to your home, see that you're coughing and will say, look, I need to collect your sputum I need to take it back to a lab and we're gonna check if you have tuberculosis, right? And if they see that you have tuberculosis, they're gonna start you on treatment, right? Um, so all of that stuff we do, the other th basic uh, main thing we can do with our you know, army of health volunteers is a lot of work around reproductive health, right? Uh, all the, all, I mean, from you know, contraceptive usage and, and you know, distributing contraceptives and increasing contraceptive usage to, of course, if women are getting pregnant, doing antenatal care services, making sure that if there are complicated pregnancies that they go to a formal healthcare provider to have their babies to postnatal. Um, and again, because of a lot of this work, I mean, if you look at the data over the last you know, 40 years of, of Bangladesh, um, you'll see that some of the gains that Bangladesh has made in reducing maternal mortality, for example, and child mortality uh, has been among, among the most impressive globally. Uh, and that also, again, I wouldn't take all the credit for that, for BRAC, but I would say the fact that we've done this huge amount of community-based healthcare work through, again, an army of health volunteers and health workers in the community, that's played a huge role in some of that. Um, so again, just to give you scale, we have right now about 60,000 health volunteers all across Bangladesh. And again, we've done health work in, in many other countries outside of Bangladesh as well. Shamaran, you succinctly and comprehensively put together what has been my thesis for a very long time, ever since uh, I read this article by Isher Jaj Aliwalia in Economics and Political Weekly about a decade ago, where she made yeah. the argument that in terms of standard of living indicators, uh, with regards to education, particularly children's access to education and women's health, um, Bangladesh was catching up and the trajectory was such that in a decade's time, it would be leading in South Asia. And she was absolutely spot on that today, Bangladesh has left Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka behind and is, you know, in South Asia has some of the best numbers. And as you said, it's not just in South Asia, but globally among the um, developing nations. Uh, so I'm, I really want to save the best for last because, you know, it is of course, absolutely critical to, make provisions for people's livelihood. And you and other macro enterprises are doing seminal work there. But health and education, to me, are as critical, if not more critical aspects of happiness and well-being. And, and the, the numbers that you just um, gave us and the, and the uh, comprehensiveness with which you guys are looking at health and education, you know, hats off to you, brilliant work. Um, I just want to end on a sort of a larger, sort of a global uh, uh, note. Uh, and you've already pointed out that beyond Bangladesh, you're, you have operations and extensive ones, not just nominal operations in half a dozen countries. So any major sort of takeaway or lesson uh, from this pandemic that, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, by being associated with macro enterprises, perhaps some borrowers have managed to insulate themselves to some extent, but the damage yeah. is not nonetheless extensive. So how right. big is the setback and what's your sense of the recovery and the rebuild phase that's coming, waiting for us? Yeah, so I would say that the, the, the setback is uh, quite profound, uh, not just economically, but, but as I said, I think this pandemic, well, I mean, you know, when we, when we take full measure of it, we'll see that the impact has not only been on incomes, but also on many other social 
uh, indicators as well. As I said, will girls go back to school? Um, you know, what will happen to our school, uh, you know, school completion rates, for example, primary, secondary, you know, what will happen to health indicators? Because for the last one year, nobody other than COVID patients have gone anywhere near a, a, a health provider, right? Because you're so scared to go to hospitals and clinics. So other things, other sort of uh, health issues have not been attended to. So I think there's going to be a lot of that. Um, um, obviously, uh, as you've mentioned before, the one thing that I've been trying to advocate for from the beginning of this pandemic and every sort of webinar I've been asked to, to, to be a part of, I've said exactly what you said. This is not the time for austerity. Um, this is the time for you know, large amounts of public spending on, on things that you know, support human capital, right? So, so you know, you know, spending on on, on supporting income uh, and, and spending on basically health and education is very, very critical to help countries come out of this pandemic. Um, of course, as you said, be because most countries have learned from you know, the last crisis, uh, most countries have done large sort of stimulus packages, uh, but even in doing so, we find uh, that you know, uh, there's a lot of lack, I mean, the capacity issue is, is there, right? So how do, we do, how do you do these transfers properly? Again, if I give you, you know, the concrete example of Bangladesh, the government came out very early and said, we're going to do this huge stimulus package, right? By Bangladesh standards, you know, coming out with a $10 billion stimulus package, you know, second month of the pandemic is, is really uh, bold, I would say, by the government. Where they've struggled is getting the money into the hands of the people who need them, right? Uh, our social insurance schemes, our social safety nets, the targeting, knowing who to, who, who to give money to, all of that has, has been a weakness. So we are, you know, from our side, we're also now starting to work on some of that with the government saying, you know, how do we make sure that the next time something like this happens, we have the, the, the data and we have the technology to be able to get money into the hands of people as quickly as possible. Um, so as I said, whether it's through financial services, you know, making sure government stimulus packages, social transfers happening more quickly and more effectively, I think the, the impact will be large, but, uh, but we've got to make sure that at this point, we go out aggressively um, and, and put money into the hands of people. I, know, I mean, you know, I heard a few, few you know, webinars where Abhijit Banerjee uh, was basically saying, if you need to print money <laughs> and, and get money into the hands of poor people, and that's the this only the way they will come out of this. This is the time. And yeah. from our side, we've been trying to promote that. But of course, that, a lot of that is, of course, in the hands of governments um, right. and multilaterals. But that's, I think, what will help us come out of this faster. Shawar and Abed, take my hat off to you and to your colleagues at Bragg for the seminal work that you're doing. It's absolutely critical, and especially at times like this. Uh, we need uh, the dedication, the innovation that you're bringing to the table. Uh, so again, thank you very, very much for your insights. Thank you so much for having me. What a great chat. Thanks to our listeners too. Kopi Time was produced by Martin Taki. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 42 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.